question, Jackie. Thanks. Hi, this is Claudia Phylos. I'm with the Center for Linux Studies in Washington, D.C. And today I'm hosting a CHS Open House discussion. We're being joined today by our special guest, Kevin McGrath. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. I really appreciate your time. Pleasure. So, Kevin, um, you're the associate uh, in Sanskrit and, and Indian studies at Harvard University. And for many years now, you have been studying and teaching both about ancient Greek epic and about the Mahabharata. Uh, which is an Indic epic, right? That's right. Um, and so, um, in addition to all this work, you are also uh, an accomplished and published poet yourself. Um, so, we're really excited to talk with you, and hopefully we'll touch upon all your areas of expertise uh, during our conversation. Um, right at the start, I just want to let people know also one important thing, that I've had the pleasure of working with you both as a teacher and as a colleague. Um, well, let's just say many years ago, I don't want to say how many, I had the pleasure of taking the Ancient Greek Hero with Professor Gregory Nash at Harvard Extension and also with you, dear Kevin. And um, I just want to let everybody know that that is something that is a distance learning course that people can take online. Um, and if they use the showcase feature on the left-hand side um, of this application, or it might actually be available uh, in a feature at the top of your Google Hangout, People can access a link to that course, so hopefully at the end we'll talk more about that. But right now I'd like to get to our subject of our conversation today, which is going to be, um, we're going to talk about Homeric charioteers and, um, and the relationship between Homeric charioteers and charioteering in the Mahabharata. Is that correct? That's right. Great. Um, and so I, I just want to invite everyone else to introduce themselves with their name and where they're from. Hi, I'm Bill Moulton from Petersburg, Alaska. Hi, Jackie Donlin from Boston. Janet Osolak from New York. Hi, I'm Jenna Cole and I live in Kentucky. I'm Sarah Scott and I'm living in Scotland. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and I'm Ali Marbury. I'm in Washington, D.C. at the Center for Hellenic Studies here. A very near dear colleague, Ali. We couldn't do all this without you. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure. <laughs> so, so let's start our conversation. Um, so, Kevin, as we start to think about charioteering, um, what are the kind of ideas that you'd like us to think about first? Well, can I make a few introductory remarks, and then we'll look at a text and see how that goes. And then, if you want, I have further points we can bring up. Read more texts and take more questions. How does that? Beautiful. Start? That's beautiful, yes. And at a certain point, we'll stop and uh, ask for questions. And if you're in our audience watching live on Google+, Plus, um, you can use the Q&A feature to submit questions. And at, that, at, the, at those times, we'll ask for them, and then we'll try and get, answer whatever questions we can. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Kevin. OK. So what we're going to look at today is the question of chariots, charioteering, and charioteers in the Iliad. But as you know, there's not a lot of evidence there. There is a store in scroll 4 and scroll 23 giving advice as to how to control these animals, these horses. And what he says is essentially restrain them. Don't urge them on. All you do is restrain them. Now, in Iliad, there's not a lot of evidence. It's a very refined and perfected and arguably a minimalist text. What you have in this poem is so perfected and so refined that there are very small details which can open out onto much larger topics. And what I'd like to do is to bring the Mahabharata, which is another epic, a similar epic, and use that as evidence, because it's six times as large, far more archa archaic, and use that as a, a lamp, as a torch, to shine on these small details in the Iliad and illuminate charioteering and the Homeric charioteer. Um, I mentioned Nestor and of course Douglas Frame, who you've seen many times and listened to on these, this R25, is the expert on Nestor with his magnificent book Hippota Nestor. So this is all with due reference to Doug's work. Now we have Diomedes and Sthenelos. We have Automedon and Patroclus. We have Automedon 
who becomes a friend of Achilles. We have Edemonaeus and Meriones, and somebody in this department did a PhD on the charioteer Meriones a few years ago, just focusing on the specific occasions where he appears and looking at what he does. And he doesn't actually drive many chariots, he's more of a, a foot warrior. And then of course we have Achilles and Patroclus. Now they are the primary charioteer and hero. These charioteers only work with heroes. There's always this duality. So this brings us to your point a little bit, Jackie, which we were discussing earlier on. You never have charioteers apart from heroes. There's this, this bivalence. They're always together. And once Patroclus is dead, Automedon becomes a friend of Achilles. He, he, he is the most honored of all the warriors at Troy, once Patroclus is dead. So there is this sequencing there. You can substitute them. And perhaps the most references, the most expressions, and the most data comes from Stenelos, who is the charioteer of Diomedes. Now, the relationship between a charioteer and a hero is perhaps the most emotional relationship that occurs in the poem. And it's a relationship that is far superior to what occurs between a hero and his son, which is a very important relationship, and certainly far superior to the relationship between a hero and a wife or a co-wife and or a concubine. So it's this relationship of amity with the charioteer that colors all of Achilles' emotional life in this poem. And then in counterpoint, we have, and you've read the Hippolytus of um, Euripides, we have Hippolytus, this chariot here, and we have this wonderful scene where he's driving his chariot, and like Antilochus, the son of Nestor, Hippolytus does not do what Nestor suggests. He is unable to restrain or subdue or to tame those horses with dire consequences. That is a nice little counterpoint. So let us read then, and then open the floor, open the screen as it were, to some discussion. And this comes from scroll five, line 835. So saying with her hand, she, and this is Athena, she drew back Stenelos and thrust him down from the chariot toward the earth. And he speedily leapt down, and she stepped into the chariot beside noble Diomedes, a goddess eager for battle. Loudly did the oaken axle creak beneath its burden, for it was bearing a terrible deity and an excellent man. Then Pallas Athena grasped the whip and the reins, and against Ares first she speedily drove the single hooved horses. So, there we are for an opening point. Questions, ladies and gentlemen? I've lost, have you lost me? I've lost your, your I've lost your sound. No, we're, we're, all, we're, we're all muted while you were talking. Um, so uh, I, I was noticing there that uh, in the passage you've just read so beautifully, um, that Athena, a, a goddess, it gets into the chariot, she muscles the other guy out of the way. Uh, and the paper that we've been reading uh, about Krishna in the Mahabharata, uh, there is also that duality of a god and a hero, as opposed to a, a therapon and a hero. Uh, and so I, I was curious about how that worked. Is, is there a difference, or is it are those two pairings seen as similar? Very nice point. Um the difference occurs between the archaic and the classical because what we have here with Athena as a charioteer is quite unique and what we have with Krishna who is a hero in the Mahabharata and yet he becomes a deity and what I wrote about in that book was about the heroic Krishna not the divine Krishna so yes I've lost your sound I'm afraid Yes, I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, certainly there is a difference. 
And there's something about the refinement which is going on in Athens, making this poem political and an essential part of the pan Athenaea festivals, and this is a competitive festival, as you know, that is similar to what happened to the archaic Mahabharata as it moved into the classical world at the beginning of the uh, first millennium. There's this shift from the old world to the new world where the deities cease to be these archaic warrior figures but actually become divine figures who are aerial. They live in the sky. So it's a nice question. Yeah. So thank you, Kevin. Just to clarify, just to clarify, uh, people will generally keep their microphones muted uh, unless they're actually speaking at that moment. That way, we don't interfere with the sound. I okay. Um, and I just want to let everybody know that uh, Sarah mentioned an article that she was reading. That's available on the CHS website. Kevin, that's your beautiful article. Um, and if you use the showcase feature in Google Plus Hangout, you can follow a link directly to that. So at this point, I would just open it back up to our community members for other questions and comments on that passage or everything that Kevin has said so far. Hey, Kevin, I'm, I'm a terrible historian, but I, that piece you just read reminded me of a historical event. Some tyrant hired a tall woman dressed up as Athena and, and riding, drove him into Athens to make a big production and get the crowd all excited. That's, that's right, Jack. It's a, it's a nice point because that still happens in India. And that was the, the tyrant Pisistratus, who was really instrumental or he organized the bringing of epic materials into the Athenian world to be used politically. So but in, in, in India today, these old epic texts are no longer are not frozen. The, the, the Iliad, for instance, is, became fixed two millennia ago, but in India, Mahabharata is now an important and active and dynamic, vivacious element in modern culture and in modern Hinduism. So uh, the leader of the BJP, um, Advani, was able to have this truck disguised as a chariot, as a rata, to use the Sanskrit term, with a very tall lady, and he used the myth of the hero Rama, who was one of the old kings of India, and used this sensibility as he drove from the villages, and the, these villagers worship Rama, to generate votes for um, his political party in the, the Delhi Lok Sabha. So <laughs> there's a lot going on there which still happens. Nice point. Did that answer your question, Jack? Yes, I'm sure that did. I think Jack was uh, going back and forth with his microphone. But um, that is absolutely beautiful and incredibly, uh, that makes it so vivid, right, about how these traditions were used um, and these myths could be used to actually change the world, right, even in, let's say, a very concrete political way. Um, yes. So thank, thank you for sharing that point. The power of myth, and as in the old world, and the power of myth today, and heroes are worshipped in cult form in India today. So you have this translation, which is very illuminating. Once again, Mahabharata telling us about Iliad. And so that's why your perspective is so valuable, Kevin, um, as you're helping us think about these things. So if there are no other questions, um, maybe we'll move on to your next passage. Can, can I just draw your attention to the, 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 the clause, and he speedily let down. This is when Athena pushes the charioteer off the chariot, Stenolos, and he leaps down. This is a phrase, this is a clause which Greg has written about a, a great deal, and we'll return to this in a minute. Mm, okay. Thank you. Other questions? So are you suggesting the chariot was moving at the time? Ah, that's our next point, Jack. Yes, I am. Okay, go for it. A very important point, the chariot is moving. Good. I think, Kevin, this would be a great point to move on. Okay. Thanks. Now, taking, that, taking Jack's point about how myth can be organized for political purposes and how these 
epic myths are still organized for political purpose, let's look at somebody called Erechtheos. And the passage here comes from scroll to line 546. All right. Um, Erechtheus, as you know, is this old founding hero of Athens. Um, and I'm drawing principally from the work of Joan Connolly here, who brought out a beautiful book earlier on this year about the Parthenon. I recommend this fine work, something she's been researching for about 20 years. And Joan has shown how, not so much how this hero, Erechtheus, is the founding proto-hero or one of the founding heroes of Athens, but there is a myth about him which expresses the fact that he invented the chariot, particularly the four-horse chariot, and that he fought the first chariot duel. Now, going from that to classical times, the frieze which surrounds the Parthenon in Athens has 20 images. And this frieze is one of the great wonders of the world. It's one of the most beautiful works of art in the world today. And I, if you go to Athens, you must go and look at this. Or if you go to London, <laughs> shall we say, you go and look at it. There's a lot of things there. So Kevin, uh, actually, can I just say one thing? So I just had the chance to do that. And I've uh, taken some pictures. And I'm going to be sharing those on Hour 25 website in the days to come. Great. So Hour 25 will have uh, sort of public access, open access images of those. So go ahead. These are the Elgin marbles, which are now housed in the British Museum. Anyway, what the, what these, there are 20 of these images which show heroes jumping down or ascending a, to a moving chariot with a charioteer um, in the box. And this, these bas-relief sculptures seemingly refer back to this myth of Erechtheus where he fought the duel which enabled Athens to become the, find itself in a, a, an urban setting. Now in the Pathenea, Panathenea, the third stage of this sequence, one of the most prestigious competitive events was, as you know, the Apobatic event. And Greg has written a great deal about this, where the armed warrior jumps down from the moving chariot, runs alongside, and then remounts. So we have a relationship here between athletics, between sculpture, and between mythology. And similarly, and I drew your attention to it, where Athena shoved aside Stenelos and he leaped down from the chariot. Greg has shown in his, artic his article, The Apobatic Moment, how important this expression is where the hero jumps down in full armor from the chariot. So we have a link, a sequence here between epic poetry, between bas-relief sculpture, between athletics, and between this founding myth of the Athenian polis. And for those of you who have looked at the Boston Idria, you will see an image of this, where the, the, the warrior is descending from the chariot, looking behind, Achilles, whilst the chariot moves forward, which is being driven, I presume, by Automedon. So, and a quick footnote here, if I can do this. In Sanskrit, this in the Sanskrit epic, this happens all the time, and the verb is avatur, avatar, avatarity. He descends, he jumps down. And this is the same word which is used when a deity becomes a mortal. The word is avatara, and we use this word colloquially as avatar. So this descent in the Sanskrit world from the divine register or divine agency to the mortal earth or world of humanity really captures what we were talking about just now, where on one point in the archaic world you have a hero, but later on that hero has become divine. They have moved from the chariot down to the earth. Now, let me just turn to scroll to line 545, and this is from the catalogue of ships. 
And they who held Athens, the well-built citadel, the land of great-hearted Erechtheus, whom Athena, daughter of Zeus, once nurtured, but the earth, the giver of grain, bore him, and she settled him in Athens in her own rich shrine, and this is the Erechtheion next to on the north side of the Parthenon, and there the youths of the youths of the Athenians, as the years roll on in their courses, seek to win his favor with sacrifices of bulls and rams. And of these in turn, Menistheus, son of Petios, was leader. No other man on the face of the earth was like him in marshalling chariots and warriors that carry shields. Only Nestor could rival him. So you see how Erechtheus is connected with the youths who remember his myth. And then you have this, this proto-king, Menestheus, who is a fabulous charioteer, second only to Nestor. So compressed into this tiny passage is this whole system of mythology about the, the, the founding hero, the inventor of the chariot, the ritual of perhaps the apobatic event, and this magnificent charioteer, second only to Nestor. So there's something in the classical world about charioteers, charioteers and chariots as a signifier, which is very powerful for the Athenian polis. Okay, over to you. That's amazing. Just to let people know, we have shared some of the links to the things that have been mentioned uh, in our showcase. So if they want to find those, they can look for those there. So. Uh, now I want to open up. Jackie, I'm very excited to take your comment. Oh, thanks. Kevin, so are you saying, I mean, th th that was a lot. That was great. <laughs> so at the time that they are zooming through the battlefield, the, the match, oh, I call the match pair, it's like the two Ajaxes that never leave their side by side. They never, you know, they act as a unit. Are they, in essence, twins? So each chariot of the driver and the hero at a certain point is a mortal and non uh, immortal and mortal twin. That uh, duality, or is that being too literal? No, no, no. The, you, the, this is being wonderfully literal. And Greg and Doug have addressed this point in a previous R25. And Doug would say, yes, this is the old Indo-European myth of twins. Whereas Greg would say, I think that. Well, this is more a Middle Eastern myth of the Therapon, the ritual mm -hmm. substitute. Whereas I would say, and this is what I'm trying to work with in a new book about Arjuna, is that in the pre-literate world, and we were talking about this before, the pre-literate world and the pre-monetary world, that's a very important quality. There's no money. Mm -hmm. Literate and pre-monetary and pre-urban world, the poet's consciousness is very different in this sort of late Bronze Age, and the poets would compose their work moving in a binary system. This is how they thought. This was mm -hmm. how the narrative came to mind. Mm -hmm. Stress that, how it comes to mind. They move almost syllogistically, almost like a fugue, moving from one to another. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at the first five the first 60 lines of Iliad, you can see this progression. The poet is moving in dualities. So yes, you can interpret it as a, the old Indo-European myth of the twins. You can interpret it as the, the um, Eastern Mediterranean myth of the ritual substitute. What I'm trying to develop in my research now is this idea of composition in the late Bronze Age where duality is almost like Bach moving his fingers in terms of a fugue. That's mm -hmm. where I'm going. So it's it's a very interesting point, and I'm open to any interpretation that you can offer. I was what I mean. I had thought, not knowing anything about the subject, was wondering whether if the chariot was how they what they built their songs on. From what you had written in your article, it, was it the spokes of the wheel, the the module? Was the internal? I can only describe it as the internal symmetry of Homeric poetry. The four based on the spokes, because that was the essence of their aesthetic and intellectual creativity. I mean, that was you know the masterpiece. Was that sort of 
were they inspired by the wheel and the spokes of the wheel to create their cycle, their ring cycle of four? There's so much that happens in four in throughout the Homeric poetry. So, but you're saying, it, but you, you're tell, you know, it, just talking about it's the haves and haves not. It's binary. So. Uh, I don't think linear thinking, and I'm being somewhat grandiose now. I don't think linear thinking, linear mm -hmm. consciousness, occurs until people begin to use prose. And once mm -hmm. you have prose, you have a very distinct use of metonymy. Whereas mm -hmm. pre-literate, pre-monetary world. Metaphor is more privileged, is okay. or dominates. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not so much the wheel, but this circular movement of things and of life and of time and of um, human existence. Can mm -hmm. we say it sounds grandiose, but that's that's underlying mm -hmm. the research I'm doing presently. Okay, thanks. Do you really think the uh, Bronze Age people did think differently than the Iron Age people like us? Oh, totally. If you go to India, people think differently there. If you if you go to Star Market, people think differently. You know, this is the basis of close reading. We are humanists, and we are not bringing our conceptual agenda to other people, other cultures, or other texts. We take our understanding of what we are not from the text or from the culture. So if you go to a little village in the desert of India, it's very difficult to understand what's happening, Jack. Whereas if you go to a village in Greece today and live there for a year, it's very difficult to understand how people think, what their emotional structure is like. It's completely different. And just as the Iliad is far removed from our culture and our time, so we have to read very carefully and very precisely so in, to and understand what's going on with in a village round the temple in the in the square with the water buffalo and so on in the fields you have to really just focus on the details and develop your understanding from those points only i'm always amazed in the iliad how the vast majority of characters seem to have no inner voice they have no clue why they're doing what they're doing they just talk about it go ahead and do it well, that is how it may appear on the surface, but we all have inner voices. It's just that the innerness is different and the voices are different. And in order to actually perceive what somebody else's inner voice is, whether it's in cinema, in painting, in epic poetry, we have to read very carefully, or look very carefully, and listen very carefully at the details. And from those inferences, we can develop an hypothesis. Kevin, you know, this makes me think about when I was, um, when I did get to participate as a student in the Ascension School version of the ancient Greek hero, and one of the words that still stands out for me these many years later is forensic. This was a word that you used to us when we were starting to read forensic. Yes. This is what Sherlock Holmes does. He builds up a narrative by tracking the details, the hidden, the details which are obvious, but because we are not aware of them, they are hidden. They might be on the mantelpiece, and we don't see them, unless you're like Sherlock Holmes and you're very careful, and you look at these details, and you build up a narrative from these points, and then you go into court and said, well, Your Honor, I saw the man in the red hat on Thursday, and the man in the red hat on Friday was seen in the bank, and incidentally, the man in the red hat next week was seen um, buying a very large automobile. Therefore, we can make this inference and launch an hypothesis. This is the this is the forensic nature of close reading. Yeah, you're right. Well, that was your word. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, um, so uh, you're also pointing us towards patterns, right? And and now we're also thinking about this kind of comparative reading. So, on the one hand, we're thinking about how we need to really be respectful of of the individual voices, right, of the individual systems in these cultures and within these epics. And at the same time, we're looking at patterns. So. You know, I'm I'm interested to see how you're guiding us through to look at these patterns and make these connections across these um, related uh, but separate epic traditions. So let's move on to the next point, unless anyone has any further questions, and look at 
the Mahabharata, which is about six times as large as um, Iliad, and far more ar archaic, is not refined, it is not perfected. And there the patterns are much larger. And we'll use the patterns we see there and see if we can identify it's just similar details in Iliad which will allow us to understand what is happening with the charioteer, the Homeric charioteer. How does that sound? Okay, so, do you have a question, Jenny? Um, well, I mean, perhaps I should wait with it because I think maybe you're leading us in this direction, but um, I was thinking about how Nestor was pointed out as um, a really important charioteer in the Greek tradition, and then in the article um, that you had written, The Portrait of the Charioteer, you talked about um, the intelligence of Krishna, and we've talked a lot about the intelligence of Nestor. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that kind of relationship between this this role in in driving this chariot, and also this role in um, kind of being a voice of intellect in a culture. Yes, this is, this is where we're going, Jenna, um, because charioteers are ambassadors and they're also poets, principally poets, and in order to function effectively in these roles, they have to have this extraordinary intelligence. So we're going there, okay? So okay. Let, let's just open up the book and have a look at Mahabharata and see um, where that takes us. And this is an epic, a Sanskrit epic, which is what Doug would say is it, it's an Indo-European epic. It's cognate with Il Iliad. They, it's, it's a tree next to another tree, but they both share the same root system, the same radical system. And they both really look back to that late Bronze Age world. The problem is Iliad has been purified, shall we say. It's been refined, and a lot of the details of that archaic world have been smoothed out. It's a, for me, the Iliad is the most beautiful and the most perfect work of poetry in the world. There's nothing like it. Iliad is, Mahabharata is much larger and much more ponderous, but it has a great deal more evidence. Um, now, in Mahabharata, chariots are sacred. They are worshipped. And when the poets describe these chariots, which is again and again and again, they lavish terrific emphasis on the beauty of them, how golden they are, how mystical they are, um, the sound of their bells, the materials which are, of which they are composed, silver and gold and so on, whereas Iliadic chariots are all made of wood, and how each individual charioteer has a chariot which has a different sound, and they're recognized. The charioteers are recognized by these sounds, and chariots take on this metaphorical state. You mentioned that before, Jack. And in the Rig Veda, which is a book of hymns, probably our earliest text, apart from Gilgamesh, that we have in the world, the hymns of the Rig Veda to the deities are very often said to be like chariots. These hymns are chariots. They take the performer, the poets, somewhere. And these chariots are beautifully made, just as the poets make their hymns beautifully. And Pindar in Pythianate, which you probably read in one of the dialogues, and it's in your source book, he actually talks about his hymn, his ode, as speeding along the road, this beautiful road towards its destination. He doesn't mention chariot, but that is the only vehicle which actually speeds along the road. So again, you have this ellipsis, this purification of classical literature, which takes the model of the archaic and just makes it much more refined. Um, and then quickly, in Mahabharata, the warriors fight with a bow and arrow. In Iliad, they fight with spears. And in Mahabharata, you have many, many chariot duels. And these chariot raids, raids chariot fighting, are, for me, emblematic or signal of that archaic world. If, the, if chariots are being talked about, you're talking about the oldest levels of this oral tradition. Um, and there's one particular hero in Mahabharata, Karna, 
and I wrote a book about him years ago called The Sanskrit Hero, and his chariot duel is the superlative duel in the poem. And when Karna dies, it's because his chariot stops. So let me just read to you from Mahabharata a description of a chariot. And a lot of the Mahabharata, or most of it, is not translated. So this comes from a, what's called the Bombay edition. It's not the critical edition. And it's book seven. I think I told you it was book six. Um, yeah, it's book seven, uh, Claudia. It's not book, six, not book six. And it's chapter 84. That foremost of cars, and the car is the chariot, of the effulgence of heated gold and of rattle resembling the deep roar of clouds, equipped by the charioteer, that's Krishna, shone brightly like the morning sun. That tiger among men, the charioteer, wearing chain mail, informed the hero, Partha, who had finished his morning prayer, of the fact that the vehicle had been equipped, that is, with arrows, with bows, and with bowstrings. That foremost of men in the world, the, diet, the crowned Arjuna, the hero, wearing golden armor with his bow and arrows in hand, circumambulated the car. This is a ritual obeisance, adored and blessed with benedictions for victory by priests who are old in ascetic penance and knowledge and years and ever engaged in the performance of religious rites and sacrifices and having their passions under control, Arjuna then ascended that great vehicle, that excellent chariot, which had previously been sanctified with spells, with, by mantras, capable of bringing victory in battle, like Surya with blazing rays, like the sun ascending the eastern mountain. And then, briefly, the bards and musicians gratified the heroic Arjuna as he proceeded with the sound of instruments and auspicious hymns of good omen, and the voices of panegyrists and bards uttering benedictions of victory and wishing him good day mingled with the sounds of instruments and was gratifying for the heroes. An auspicious breeze, fraught with incense, blew from behind them, escorting the vehicle towards the battle. So you can see the, the difference in the poetry of Mahabharata and Iliad. One is very refined and very precise, whereas the poetry of Mahabharata is much more extensive and amplified and magnificent and draws upon many, many more metaphors constantly. Mm -hmm. So, there we are. So, could that have been any more solar? I mean, that had to be Helios rising, not some guy going to battle. That was a major production to go through every morning. Well, the, the most important hero of the Mahabharata has a divine father, and that is the sun, Surya. So, yes, nice point again, Jack. <laughs> You're doing well today. <laughs> so that's actually Bill. Sorry, but Jack, um, Sorry. that's okay. Jack, Jack. You at the other end. And Jack is also um, very, um, you know, interested in charioteering and charioteers. So I'm sure if he has a question, um, he'll join in. So thank you so much. So is that, sort of ritual, is that sort of ritual typical in that poem, that it's that much involvement to get somebody up and going in the morning? Yes, this happens all the time. This incredibly lavish description of the beauty, the mystical beauty, and the mystical power of chariots. And as I said, chariots as metaphors become these extraordinary vehicles which are used as reference to hymns or any kind of praise for the deities. The chariot takes the song up into the sky. So chariots in the, the Indic world have this very cosmic resonance, which is lost in the, uh, in the Hellenic world. As you're reading, that reminded me, though, of a couple of just subtle snippets in, in Iliad, and one of them was the, the description, which I don't have to hand, the description of Aphrodite in her chariot. Yeah. And I think she has sparrows and so on. Yeah. And that's described as gold, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. And the other was the armor of Achilles, uh, which has a, a whole bunch of people making music. Yeah. Now, that's armor, not a chariot, but 
it just seemed to resonate slightly. Does does that seem like a, a reasonable an analogy to make? Absolutely. This, this is my my point that what you have in great extent in Mahabharata, you have in very small details in the Iliad. So here we have amplitude, and here we have precision and unique reference. So that's the the, the the purpose of this comparative method. And we had a student, we've had several students in fact, but one in particular who was in the class in spring, and he was examining the Irish epic, the Toyn, and the, the Saxon epic, the Beowulf, and bringing these references to the Homeric poetry. Because once again, you have this great detail, and um, in Iliad and Odyssey, you have very, very small, little, precise images. So, yeah, nice point. Oh, that, so, that is just, just so so exciting because Jack and I are actually also looking at uh, Beowulf uh -huh. uh, and have ambitions to look at the Irish epics at some point as well. So this is something that we'll definitely be able to bring into that. Right, Jack? So, so thank you. Yes, great. Hello, Jack. Sorry, I was misnaming you. <laughs> no, that's all right. I always, uh, when, when uh, someone uh, uh, gets gets the name a little off, I um, I always say, I wonder what life would have been if my uh, mother had thought to uh, name me Bill. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I just didn't want to get a, get ahead of ourselves. Uh, you 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 you. You've uh, dropped back and uh, are uh, looking at this so deeply. Uh, there, there's uh, there's so many questions I, I do have. Uh, I don't. Uh, well, the Karna um, character is certainly, uh, I think, much more interesting than uh, than Arjuna that I, that I had heard about so much more uh, earlier in life, um, and. Um, I wonder if we're getting to that, if we're going to have time to get to Karna today. Yes. Um, just let me say briefly, though, that going back to this idea of duality again, in the epic world, a hero always has a particular opponent, a bhaga. And Arjuna and Karna are appointed to fight each other. This is this, this question of duality or ambivalence or bivalence again. And Karna is very mortal. He dies. Um, he doesn't go up into the sky. I've been writing about this all summer. He has no contact with the divinities except in one brief occasion. Whereas Arjuna is not simply superhuman. Karna is superhuman. Arjuna is supernatural. So again, we have this divine twin relationship, if you like as Doug would say, one which is mortal and the other which is supernal. And they are locked together in the narrative. When one occurs, the other is bound to occur. And when one dies, the other triumphs. So yes, Jack, a very nice point. So Kevin, actually, at this point, I just want to point out, um, remind people that you actually ha are um, a very beautiful poet. and. Um, Actually, in the showcase, we actually have a link. You mentioned the word supernatural. So uh, I'm thinking that that may be a, sort of a key word for you because you have a book of poetry called Supernature, and people can learn more about that in the showcase. Um, at the same time, actually, I know you have more to cover, but we also have questions in our Q&A feature. Uh, and I was wondering uh, if we could take some time to answer a couple of those from the people, from our viewers uh, on Google+. Plus. Yes. Would this be an okay time? So, um, actually, you might be able to see them yourself. If you go to the left-hand side of your Google Plus frame, you should see a little blue Q&A icon. If you don't, that's okay. I'll read the questions to you. Uh, if, you move, if you move your cursor over to the left-hand side of the frame. Well, well, I, have, I have that, but why don't you read them out, Claudia? That's great. I'd be happy to. So, uh, first, we have a question from Kimmy. She's asking for a little further um, comment. She says, could you discuss further, as to your comment, fugue psychological state of a poet? Ah, yes. Big, big point, Kimmy. Um, what I'm trying to develop in my work is an understanding of 
the consciousness of the poets in the pre-literate, pre-monetary, and pre-urban world. I'm working within the frame of the Parry Lord Nage system of epic poetry or pre-literate studies. That's where I'm coming from. And I'm taking the work of these three scholars and applying them to the Mahabharata and trying to not simply see how they did it, but what it was that lay behind how they did it, the consciousness. Because it, 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 the consciousness is different. And as close readers, we have to be able to understand that. So. If you look at the first 50 lines of Iliad, Kimmy, we'll see that the poets develop the song going from one note to another, A to B, A to B, A to B, A to C, A to C, B to C, B to C. This is, it's fugal, as it were. Or it's, to use another musical term, it's canonical, where you have part singing. And for me, this is how the poets bring the poem to mind, how it comes to mind. They think in terms of duality. And this is the main thrust of this book that I've been working on for a year, 18 months. And it's very difficult to actually pin it down because there is so much evidence. Um, but this is where I'm going. So I hope that answers your question, Kimmy. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, let's, let's take one more question. So this is from Anon. Um, and so Renan is asking us to return again to the kind of topics Jackie was mentioning, the image of the chariot wheel. And he's thinking about the relationship between the chariot wheel, which is a work of a carpenter uh, who fits things together, and the poet, and particularly the charioteer in the Mahabharata. So can you say a, a couple of words about that? Um, he's also thinking about the way that uh, the harmony and harmo uh, All right. in relation to chariot wheels and a sense of a joint um, together in the woodwork uh, of the word of harmony. Um, can I move to my next point then? Great. 1147, and I'll bring that in, Renan. All right? Um, poets and charioteers. So um, a few qualities, a few skills of the charioteer then in Mahabharata. One is that they... They're, they're well born. They have to come from high status families. Two, they have to have a terrific knowledge of horses, the breeding, equine law, medical knowledge of horses. Three, they have to have skills of management. If a warrior is not ambidextrous, they can only shoot to one side with their bow, or they throw their spear to one side. So the charioteer stands to the right and the warrior stands to the left and the charity is constantly trying to manage the horses to put his warrior, his hero, at an advantage and to put the opposing charioteer at a disadvantage so that they, the hero can shoot to the left, if you see my point. Now, another point, and this is goes back to Claudia years ago when we were talking in class about the relationship between um, the agonistic relationship between Apollo and Achilles, and we were talking about how Apollo is a healer, how Apollo is skilled in medicine. And we looked at scroll 11, line 8 to 8, and saw how Achilles also knew about medicine. And remember, Achilles is also a charioteer. He drives his own chariot. You see this on um, Vaz illustration. And Achilles learned his medical skills from Chiron, this old centaur. Again, this, this theme of the horse. And after that class, Claudia sent me this message saying, what about Patroclus, Kevin? He too is a healer. And he is the one who actually heals somebody in the Mahabharata, in, in the Iliad, which is around scroll 11, line 840 or so. So I always remember that message, Claudia. Um, and then, I'm coming, Renan, to your point. Charioteers are also ambassadors because they are good at remembering and they're good at seeing. And Phoenix, who is a charioteer, he is the one who umpires the chariot race in scroll 23. He, in scroll 11, is one of the ambassadors. And in Mahabharata, charioteers of the caste, to use that 19th century word, this occupational kinship group, charities are always used as ambassadors. Now, Renan, your point. Charities as poets. They 
because they're in the chariot with the hero, they see the battle. They're like CNN or they're like the, the journalists embedded in the Humvees as they, the forces, the coalition forces go into Baghdad. These are the ones, the charioteers are the ones who see what's happening. So when Patroclus is killed, uh-oh, what's who's going to record and remember what Achilles did? And you know Achilles is profoundly concerned with his story, his fame, his Kleos. And even the name of the chariot here is Kleos. Regus talked about this. Um, and when Achilles captured Briseis, when he killed the father of Andromache, when he killed, captured, and then later killed Lycaon, these events, these raids before Troy, Patroclus was there and would have known about these. Patroclus is the one who recalls, um, would recall, the Kleos, the Clea Andron of Achilles. And the three poets in, in the Iliad, of course, in Scroll 11 of Patroclus, Achilles and Phoenix. These three poets sing the Clea and these three charioteers, sorry, sing the Clea Andron. And in Mahabharata, this is, as usual, much more amplified because the cast, and the word is Varna, which just means color, the cast of the poet is also the cast of the, the of the charioteer. If you talk about suitors, you're either talking about poets or about charioteers. So Renan, yes, there's something about these poets who f these charioteers who fit together the song, and you in introduce this metaphor of the wheel. It's a very nice metaphor, and it works. They fit together the cycle, which goes to proclaim the deeds and the accomplishments of the hero, and. The language, the lexicon of poets and of charioteers draws upon the same vocabulary. They use the same words. And I see we're running out of time, Claudia, so maybe we should just sure, yeah. read something and then take a few questions and see where that takes us. And I'd like to go to scroll five, line 239. Um, so I hope that helped to answer your question, Renan. It's not a full answer, but it's a beginning. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about Stenelos. So saying, they mounted the inlaid chariot and eagerly drove the swift horses against the son of Tydeus. And Stenelos, the glorious son of Capaneus, saw them and immediately spoke to Tydeus' son winged words. And note the word he, the poet sees. This is very important what the poets see. Diomedes, son of Tydeus, dear to my heart, I see two mighty warriors eager to fight against you, endowed with measureless strength. The one is well skilled with the bow, Pandareus, and moreover, boasts that he is the son of Lycaon. And it goes on. The poets see, and there is a lot about drawing the attention of the hero to what the poets will see the poets as charioteers, and they say, Pasha, Pasha, look. And whether they're the charioteer drawing the attention of the hero, or the poet drawing the attention of the audience, they will use this same word, Pasha. So mm -hmm. I've compressed a lot here, Renan, but does that answer your question? Yes, so I, you know, unfortunately, I, um, we won't get that response. I think, you know, Renan can actually respond in our discussion forums. There's a place where this conversation can continue after our conversation today that's live. So if people have questions afterwards, they're welcome to join the conversation. If you watch this video at a later day and time, that's great. But let's take some more comments from the people in our, um, in our discussion right now because I know that was so beautiful. This is completely off topic, but I promised my wife I would ask. Have you ridden the chariot? Oh. <laughs> I ridden in the chariot? Yeah, have you? Yes, because there are still chariot races in my village. <laughs> in England. Well, tell us about it. Tell us a story. And these chariot races, they're very bumpy. The chariots are not driven by horses, but they're driven by oxen. And they're very beautiful chariots. They're only used once a year in these races. And the chariots, so that these, the, the athletic events, their horse races, young men bareback on horses, on colts, there is wrestling, and there are these chariot races, the rata, and they celebrate the, the hero who was one of the founding 
not the founding heroes, but an important hero in medieval times in the region where I study, which is called the Kutch, who was a Muslim. So again, you have this nice coherence of mythology, epic systems of poetry, contemporaneous rituals, but which fuse the the community, a diverse community, where you have Hindus and Muslims living in one village. So yeah, I've ridden in one of those chariots. <laughs> and and did you turn the post, or did you have an accident? No, they're just in a straight line over the sand. It would be too difficult to turn the oxen. <laughs> yeah. That was actually that was actually a great question. Never in my I never imagined that's a beautiful. I wish we had a picture of that, Kevin. If you have one, I hope you'll share it. We'll post it. Um, so, any other questions about um, this idea of sight and looking? Sarah, yeah, okay. Sarah? Uh, it was actually a different question, um, uh, okay, but yeah. it, it was actually, um, it, it was um, because a lot of us are probably now very keen to go off and and read some of the Mahabharata. I wondered, is there a particular edition you would recommend, or particular segments or books that uh, you would suggest we could start with, or is it kind of all scattered throughout? It's what would be a good starting point? It's a very large work, and it would take you months and months to read. And there's no real translation of the, the critical text. There's this old 19th century Victorian translation of earlier, the Bombay text, which I read to you. What you can read is something by a colleague called John Smith, who was at Cambridge, he's now retired, lives in Spain, and it's a penguin version, and he has the whole text, some of it is trans perfectly, beautifully translated, and parts are summarized. So you have the whole text in a single volume, either precisely or in summary. So you can go through the whole poem and then go to the yeah, the, 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 the main text, if you're interested in um, further details. J.D. Smith, Penguin. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I think we'll all, all be off going and buying a copy. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious about this concept of Vimana, uh, these uh, divine chariots that don't have horses. Yes. Um, there's a Vimana in the other epic, the other Sanskrit epic, um, called the Ramayana, which I, I don't really study, but I, I know something about. And the hero there is Rama. And his divine antagonist is somebody called Ravana, who has one of these Vimanas, one of these vehicles. Um, and in iconography, all deities have a vehicle. And the vehicle can be a swan, the vehicle can be a tortoise, the vehicle can be um, a monkey. So this idea of a chariot which allows the mortal and the immortal to cohere and to communicate takes on many metaphorical forms. So in a nutshell, Jack, that is the nature of the Vimana. But Vimanas essentially move by the will, by the consciousness of the warrior or the deity who is within that vehicle. There is no, it's not being driven by horses. Tank, it, tanks in, in the Indian Army. It means that it's a part, it's a part. It's sort of like, is that sort of like the holy, uh, the holy car or uh, what is, what is the, how do, how do you, does one when one hears Vimana, how do you f do you feel awed by by the um, divine manas or or is that just my ignorant? Uh... The Vimana is a divine vehicle which which communicates its passenger or its director between the registers of the cosmos between the earthly and the superior, the, the aerial. It doesn't go into the underworld. It just goes up and down between the earth and the sky. But yes, it's something very beautiful and profoundly mysterious and cosmic. Well, thank you. Can Kevin. I ask one more question? Oh, I've, oh, sure. I've been trying to catch up on, uh, on uh, Mycenaean Greek with uh, uh, Chadwick's and Ventress's uh, book here. And 
to me, this looks like a visit to the barn of the uh, of the heroes of the Iliad. Uh, they're, uh, they're these inventories of uh, chariot pieces, uh, and uh, there's some speculation there with uh, uh, you know how the how were the the chariots stored? Were uh, the the wheels were taken off, and and the chariot was sort of dry docked and and uh, uh, covered, uh, you know, to protect it from uh, moisture. Uh, and, and as I thought about it, well, well, of course you've got to do a lot of maintenance on these uh, on these chariots. Uh, parts are wearing out, uh, and if uh, things go out of shape. Uh, you, uh, you you may be like uh, Karna there with your wheels stuck in the dirt and <laughs> and you get killed. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, have we come much beyond uh, where uh, Chadwick was in 1973 in our understanding of uh, the uh, the chariot pieces that are described? Uh, in, in these uh, linear B tablets? Most of our understanding of chariots comes from iconography, from vase illustration, or even from graffiti, and from burials, rather from the tablets. That's where we know what's, what compose these, these, these chariots, Jack, um, Jack, and how they were made. And they were made of wood, generally. Um, so those materials didn't last very long. And this is a subject which we haven't actually talked about today, is how these vehicles were made, how the horses were managed, what happens if you have two horses, what happens if you have four horses like you have in Mahabharata. In Iliad you have three horses. So there's a, this is an, almost another field, a technical field in itself, Jack which we haven't actually touched upon, but as you say, it's a, a rich store, and it helps us to understand what was going on. Chariots in Mahabharata, chariots in Central Asia, chariots in Egypt, and chariots in the Minoan and Mycenaean world. Well, thank you, Kevin. You know, I think I, we need to be respectful of people's time because I know you may have other engagements, and also uh, people are joining us in the middle of the day, sometimes on their lunch hour. So I just want to take this time to thank you again for joining us. This was such a helpful conversation for me. I know for the members of our community, we really appreciate your time and expertise, and we hope you'll come back and join us um, at a future date, maybe. I would love to. So we've looked at the chariot as a hero, the charioteer as a friend, the charioteer as a poet, as an ambassador, as a physician, and there are many other qualities of the charity which we haven't even touched upon today. Mm -hmm. But leaving it at that, thank you everybody for all your yeah. wonderful thoughts, and Claudia, thank you. Thank you. And just a reminder for everyone that if you're interested um, in having, let's say, a more uh, formal course experience where you have credit um, and you write papers that might be graded, by Kevin himself, uh, you should consider going to the Harvard Extension School website and signing up for the Ancient Greek Hero. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, experience. I can tell you from my own uh, time at the course. I've done it twice. I audited. I took it once. I audited it another time. It's a life-changing experience. You wouldn't regret it. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Take care. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.